Leslie and Mary, thank you. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and specifically talk about drought. And this particular talk only concerns Oklahoma, but I think many of the um, things we've seen here are indicative of other areas that have been under persist persistent drought in this decade. Uh, just as an overview, uh, some of the effects that we've seen, uh, many of the, the effects are persistent and they're chronic. Uh, they, they become cumulative over time. But you also have uh, certain acute toxic effects that occur uh, that uh, are, re are uh, uh, that cumulative, more, more the collateral effect that I spoke about earlier. One of the things that I want to point out later in my presentation is how all uses are affected. We tend to think of of drought, I think, sometimes uh, in terms of ecology, but but all uses, public water supply, um, recreational uses, agricultural uses become affected by by a drought. And I want to break up the presentation into three different sections uh, in terms of talking about data quality, how it affects representative data. Uh, talk a little bit about data trends, not in a statistical sense, but but in a sense of maybe looking at yearly means and medians, and then some some about sampling logistics mixed in and in and through the and through the talk, which is in terms of of record interruption has been one of the biggest things for us to deal with because we're a, we're a program that that monitors our our programs are trend programs, so we're monitoring annually year after year at the same locations in a lot of our programs. We have some programs that are or are more periodic or episodic in terms of how they approach uh, monitoring design, but the majority of our programs are trend programs. Let me set the stage just a little bit. Um, these are both, um, <coughs> excuse me, these are both annual and five-year tendencies presented in these two graphics from the Oklahoma Climatological Society, and these represent the period of record. Uh, the top is precipitation, the bottom is temperature, and let me point out two things to kind of set the stage here. One is that the drought that we're currently talking about, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but it's if you look at the top graphic, it's the brown area below that long-term average trend line is the drought that I'm specifically going to be speaking of today, uh, the most recent one in, the, in, in this decade. But to set the stage a little bit and get perspective, we came out of nearly a 30-year wet period in, in, in our state, and I believe probably throughout the entire Midwest, that somewhat set of uh, perceptions and expectations of, uh, both, ci of both citizens and, and professionals in terms of what was the norm. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is while this has been occurring here, we've been in an extended warming period, which uh, is, has exacerbated the issue. And we'll come back to that top graph in a few minutes. So let's talk about effects on representative data first. Um, one one thing obviously is persistent hydrological effects, pooling versus flowing water, uh, record interruption occurs. Uh, how do you how do you monitor uh, this this in accordance with protocols that you've been monitoring here forever? How do you match up these two record sets? And that's a challenge that we're still facing. How you deal with that? Uh, if if you're monitoring only only stagnant pools, which is is available water. How does that relate back to what was typically flowing water, even at its lowest level? And then, obviously, if you have significant record interruption uh, month after month, that becomes a significant issue. A second question we, we ask is, what is perennial? This is the North Fork of the Red River near Carter, Oklahoma, which, as you can see by the USGS graphic, has had a, had a period of record in terms of flow for uh, nearly 70 years. So it just interrupted one time in the 60s. If you relate this back to the graphic I showed earlier on precipitation and match up the, the brackets, the colored brackets together, as you can see, this latest drought period, um, the hydrologically is much more significant uh, than the three most previous extended drought periods in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Part of that, and then it's something we'll we'll discuss a little bit in a, in in in, in, a few, in some future slides is is water depletion uh, it being a confounding factor whenever you start to look at drought. Uh, we uh, water mining is, is is typical in an agricultural state uh, where groundwater is used for irrigation and also for water supply to municipalities. 
and that compounding effect whenever you become whenever you whenever you start into these these long term drafts which are going to be a natural part of that cycle uh the effect that you see on on flowing water bodies surface water becomes much more profound as you can see in this picture and another problem for us is loss or degradation of reference condition uh, this is the little river near cloudy oklahoma which is part of the upper uh, the Upper Little River. It's a high gradient area. It flows out of the Washita Mountains. Uh, very, very low impact. The only real impact in the area is, is, is some silviculture, but even that is uh, most of the river uh, is protected from that. Typically wetted. What you see in the upper left-hand corner is the typical condition of that river. And just to draw you, uh, these pictures are taken basically at the same point in different years. Is is our effect on being able to utilize this as, as, as to, to estimate reference condition. We have a loss of perennial pool habitat, which has occurred. We have a loss of sampleable streamside habitat, which is, is, is one of the, the richest targeted habitats that we monitor for our benthic macroinvertebrates. And riffle habitat throughout this reach becomes practically non-existent. And so you're going to see an effect on both the, uh, a pretty extensive uh, effect on both the fish and the and the bug communities. So how do you how do you use that in terms of being able to relate back to reference condition? And that's a question that currently we're struggling with throughout the state, um, and, and and being able to rate rate sites in terms of their 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 biological condition. Sample locations become inaccessible. We not only have an extensive stream monitoring program, but an extensive lake monitoring program as well. Uh, the top upper left-hand corner is, is Canton Lake, which I'll talk again about here in a little while. Uh, at this lake, there's no access to our lacustrine zone, uh, uh, which is, is one of the main zones that we monitor on, on all of our lakes. Um, Water bodies become inaccessible. This, 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 what you're seeing with this boat ramp is not unusual in our lakes, especially in western Oklahoma. We've taken to purchasing 10-foot John boats, which crews can now carry to the water body along with a uh, small horsepower motor and all their sampling equipment to be able to access whatever, whatever lake that that, that has slowly become a farm pond is now there. Um, so we get, so we're able to get some data. Uh, watersheds become disconnected. This is the upper one of the, we also sample riverine zones uh, uh, in, in our lakes. And this particular lake, there was no access to the riverine zone at all for for a, a number of sampling periods. A deployed instrumentation, uh, the effect on it, loss of fidelity in terms of the the data record. Uh, sensors go out of water. Sedimentation becomes much more of an issue. Uh, we have taken to using more. Radar sensors, uh, only as you see in the, as you can see in that upper left hand, only because it's it's a one of their non-contact and they're much easier to manage. But when you're dealing with moving beds consistently, it becomes an issue. And um, then you add in the confounding factor of drought, where you may be having to center over a changing where a changing pool is occurring over from year to year. Uh, the one storm that does come through, which shifts all the sand around, either from a hundred to to 200, maybe sometimes up to 1,000 feet uh, away from where you were, uh, that becomes an issue. So there are many issues that we face with deployed instrumentation. And I'm sure our USGS cohorts in the state would, would be able to, to testify to that as well. Uh, data trends, again, of course, these are not statistical trends. These are more just a, a view. It's a, very, it's a very rudimentary analysis of some of the data that we have. And we're we're beginning to do more of a an in-depth analysis of the effect of drought. But I want to look at uh, some some in-place uh, uh, monitoring, such as water temperature. I'm using chlorides here as a surrogate for for conductivity. Um, and uh, we'll look at the next graph looks at nitrates, and I also want to look at effect on chlorophyll. And again, like I said, these are not these are these are very rudimentary, and this is a very rudimentary analysis. Uh, but as you can see, the, the red the red depicting drier years. If you go back to the, let me take you back to this graphic. Uh, the red predicting the drier years that are that are uh, depicting drier years that are depicted by the the black dots in this graph, the annual the annual precipitation amounts, and uh, the the green predicting the wetter years. Uh, 
or depicting the wedding years, uh, there seems to be at least some upward trend in, in chloride concentration throughout the state. Now, the median amount is very low because we have a lot of very low, con uh, low, con low conductivity sites, so they're going to have very low chloride concentrations. But the, the mean chloride concentration tends to be going up on Oklahoma streams during these drought periods. Another interesting thing I saw in the data was, was this effect on water temperature. Uh, there tends to be a greater than one degree difference in water temperature from dry years to wet years. If you look at nitrogen in both lakes and streams, uh, there is a this being only summer data, not 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 year round data. The signal that you see during these dry years uh, tends to show a much higher uh, nitrogen nitrogen mean. And finally, looking at chlorophyll A concentrations in both lakes and streams uh, in the summer months. Again, you see the same effect during these dry years, especially during this persistent drought time from 2010 to 2012. And this is not depicted through 13 or 14 data, obviously, but I believe we would see the same thing. You're seeing a a, a very high concentration of chlorophyll, much higher concentration of chlorophyll A uh, during those drier years than during the wetter years. The data in the next two slides are uh, from our our streams. Uh, probabilistic monitoring program where we monitor over two-year periods and so we have different two-year periods that we can compare over time. 2008 and 2009 was a wet period. 2010-2011 was a dry period. The percentages that you see in the in the table represent the percent of flowing water miles in poor, in poor conditions specifically. And as you can see for these various stressors, conductivity, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, turbidity, and, and sediment as a stressor, there was a, a an increasing trend and in percent of flowing waters in poor condition from a wet from the wet period to the dry period. Now, of course, this only represents a a, a, a two different study periods. Um, however, I think that's that's a that's a telling it's a that's a telling trend overall in in stressor relationships uh, during these during these wetter versus drier periods. Um, and two of those were significant: turbidity and sediment. In, in looking at condition of indicators, again, percent of flowing waters in poor condition, and again, you have uh, the dry years from 2010 to 2011 and, and, and wet years from 2008 to 2009. I specifically want to look at the algae, the algae uh, trends here. Again, we see a significant upward trend uh, from, from, 2000, from the 2008-2009 period to the 2010-2011 period in both benthic or substrate algae and systonic or water column algae. Switching gears a little bit, and I'll close with this, talking about uses. Um, again, we tend to think of only ecological uses at times, um, but there's water bodies in Oklahoma and most states, uh, from a regulatory standpoint and also from a management standpoint, have uses that are related to uh, public water supply, uh, agriculture, both irrigation, uh, and, and livestock uh, watering, uh, recreational beneficial uses. And something I want to point out right now before we start in this conversation is that oftentimes those uses are competing against one another. There's a water right that's owned by somebody uh, that was a first in time, first in right, that particularly when you're looking at a reservoir that provided maybe the money to build that reservoir has, has paid off the long-term debt. And so those uses become competing. And when there's plenty of water to go around, uh, there is no real competition. Everybody's happy. But when water becomes scarce, you begin to see the, the arguments occurring and, and you begin to see those uses, uh, one use becoming much, much more uh, 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 affected based upon the need of maybe that primary use, which is typically water supply or irrigation. So the first thing I want to talk about is specifically water supply. The Shawnee... Shawnee Twin Lakes, uh, which is a fairly large municipality in the central part of Oklahoma, has two water supply lakes, uh, Lake, Lake, Lake Two and One. They're connected by a, a canal uh, that feeds one to the other. And of, 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 of importance on the upper lake that you see is it also has a, there's a pipeline that runs from another reservoir, which isn't pictured here, which actually helps to fill that lake. 
and then provides water as 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 this as these lakes go down and become and the pool goes lower, provides water back to the municipality of Shawnee to use. In the drought that the, the most recent drought, uh, that canal was cut off, and so being able to feed from one to the side to the other became a became a, a, a huge issue, not only in water supply but the quality of water which was being fed across that canal was oftentimes um, much lower quality because of uh, the effects of 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 the conservation pool on the on the quality that was present in Lake Two. Consumptive versus environmental versus recreational use becomes an issue just to set the stage here. Canton Lake, which is in the upper left hand the upper left hand corner map, Canton Lake which sits in the upper left hand corner, is a was specifically built to store water for the city of Oklahoma City. And the city of Oklahoma City has various draws water from various water supplies uh, and it's in the surrounding municipalities. It's an area of about a million people. Um, in the lower left hand in the lower right hand corner you see Lake Hefner, which is one of those main water supply lakes and lakes and, and Lake Overholzer just, just to the south and east of it, or south and west of it, excuse me. But these lakes in the upper part of in the in the upper part of northwest Oklahoma are meant to store water which are then fed down to these water supply lakes as needed. In other words, the city of Oklahoma City owns basically the entire conservation pool of, of Canton Lake. Hefner Lake, as you can see in the pictures to the right, became almost unusable. Uh, in fact, the the uh, the withdrawal pipes for the water supply were 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 nearing not being accessible based on the based on the level of the lake. Uh, there were also some recreational issues that were occurring. It's a big sailing lake, uh, but that was a, a lower, much lower use. Oklahoma City decided to exercise their right to the entire pool of Canton Lake, and last in in, in 2014 uh, drew that lake down. Um, currently, Canton Lake is a zero percent of conservation pool. It's actually below it, and so you. And this has created quite a firestorm, uh, as you as you might as you might uh, uh, expect. Uh, Canton Lake is a is a big fishery. Um, it's also it's, uh, for things such as walleye and largemouth bass, uh, and also supports that fishery supports several local communities because of the folks who come in and camp and 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 recreate on that lake. Another example of consumptive versus environmental and recreational use, Lugard Luger Altus Reservoir, uh, water rights are owned completely by the local irrigation district. This is in southwest Oklahoma. It was it was drawn down as well, and it 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 became there no no there's been no rain in this area for years since severe drought, and uh, very little rain, excuse me, and the majority of the, of the water there is is used to grow cotton, and the lake was specifically built for to provide irrigation water to the cotton growers in the area. It's led to several things. There was a golden algae fish kill which occurred in 2011, which was kind of ancillary, which killed a number of fish, but then there was a total kill related to the drought from 2013 to 2014. And we just recently worked another kill in the area that was um, uh, in one of the, I, I think you would, you could call them many farm ponds that the lake has now become. They're somewhat connected hydrologically, but they're all just kind of their own little systems now. Um, and that lake, like much like Canton Lake, is near zero percent of its conservation pool. There's not much of a lake left. Anyway, that's all I have for today, and. Um